Welcome everyone to Home Office Hours Live with Vistaprint. Thank you so much for joining us today. If you haven't joined us before, Home Office Hours is a series of live discussions that we've started on timely topics and we'll be featuring guest speakers as well as our very own Vistaprint team members. Our goal with this series is to provide you with education and advice for surviving these uncertain times during the COVID-19 crisis. We know that small business and entrepreneur needs have changed and we wanted to help. So we created the series as a way to connect during this time when we're all spending a lot of time inside and we're dealing with various challenges when we're working from home. We've tapped colleagues to help answer some of the questions that you're all having as business owners. So today we have with us Ellen Greer, Vistprint Digital Product Manager. Ellen, can you give us a hello? Hey folks. Hey Ellen, thank you for joining us. And we also have guest panelist Antoine Byers, an entrepreneur, professional dancer, and digital content creator. Antoine, can you say hello? Hey, y'all. Hey, thank you for joining us today. And we are here to discuss getting your business set up to offer online classes and virtual services. Before we get started and jump into it, just a couple of housekeeping items. We are going to take questions at the end of the session, but you can absolutely submit those questions all throughout the session. If you're on Zoom, you can use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. If you're joining us via Facebook Live, you can just comment your question there on Facebook and we will receive that in the Q&A in Zoom. And one more thing, we'll be sending the recording out after we wrap up via email. So let's get started. Antoine, you are a great example of an entrepreneur who's really had to adapt on the fly right now. And your work relies so heavily on personal and physical interactions and connections. Can you elaborate on how you've continued to connect during this time as you've had to shift online? Yes. Um, thanks, Corey. And thank you guys for having me today. I'm so excited to be talking with everyone. Um, so yes, I wear several different hats. So I've had to adapt in a lot of different ways. Um, as a professional dancer, obviously my work requires a lot of touching and rehearsals and performances. Um, I usually perform at Lincoln Center at the Metropolitan Opera, and we can have up to 4,000 audience members a night. And sometimes our cast can be up to 100 people at once. So obviously my work has had to shift a little bit. Um, I was already creating a lot of content online, but a lot of my performances these days have been happening on Instagram via photo or video. Um, so I've had to get really creative and stay open with what I consider a performance right now. As far as teaching, I've been teaching several different online classes for different companies and brands. Uh, this has been really cool because I've been able to reach a new audience that I maybe wouldn't have prioritized before. Uh, so I've taught classes for Capizio, Joffrey, uh, my home company at the Metropolitan Opera, um, as well as had several opportunities to teach private lessons, which has been really cool and exciting. Um, as a mentor, I think mentorship is so important. Um, and I always joke and tell people that I'm the product of good, good mentors and a scholarship fund. <laughs> um, but luckily, I was already working with the company Mentorly on online video mentoring sessions. Um, so that's been great because I can connect with people from all over the world. So I have mentors in the United States um, or mentees in the United States, but I also have some mentees in places like Australia and South Africa. And this has been great because I've been able to maintain any relationships that, are, that I already had, um, as well as expand and develop new relationships as well. Um, I also work as a social media consultant. So I've had to really pull from the archives and get creative with how I wanna make old things new. Um, it's been really important for me right now with the companies that I work with to make sure that our content is timely right now. Uh, we are still in the middle of a global pandemic, so we have to make sure that whatever we're um, releasing makes sense and uh, is sensitive and timely with the moment that we're in right now. Um, and as far as developing new businesses, I also work with a lot of different companies on how to strategize new businesses. So it's been really interesting to be on the other side to see how some companies are on pause right now, but there's a whole side of um, this industry or the industry of people who are still working right now. Um, so that's been really interesting to navigate. But um, in general, everyone has so much extra time right now. Um, so this is a great time. If you can't start a new business, it's a great time to plan one. Um, you can start digitally networking and find people to help you develop your website, your logo, um, any video or photo editing you might need or any type of design help you might need. And if you're not a person looking for that help, you might be a person that can offer that help. Um, so right now it's great because everyone has time and everybody also needs work. So overall, it's been a lot of sensitivity and prioritizing. 
Uh, luckily, my income is pretty diverse, so not all of my industries are being hit the same way. Um, but I've had to definitely remain flexible in my approach on how to keep all of my different uh, professional endeavor endeavors afloat. You are not kidding. You definitely do wear a lot of hats. Um, thank you for sharing all of that background with us. It's great to hear the firsthand experience and excuse the pun, but it's great to see how quick you've been on your feet. <laughs> I'm good at that sometimes. <laughs> so Ellen, at Vistaprint, uh, we've definitely been keeping an eye on entrepreneurs and businesses like Antoine who are striving to pivot. Can you give us some examples of ways that we've seen other businesses that are maintaining and fostering those online connections? Yeah, absolutely, Corey. So we did a survey of small businesses in the US and UK, and 50% of them are pivoting towards boosting their online presence. So the biggest things that we're seeing is that they're increasing social media marketing and email marketing too. We know that aside from just marketing one's business, in a lot of cases, the actual operations and services that a business might provide, this is a good time for those services to go digital and go virtual as well in this moment when so many of us are, you know, maintaining that social distance from each other. So the main three things that I'm seeing really are folks running online classes for large groups, holding virtual one on one or small group meetings or posting on demand video content that their audience can go and watch whenever they like. Awesome. It's great to hear those stories of businesses adapting. Thank you. So Antoine, let's dive a little further into your story. Um, it definitely helps to get the play by play of the thought process um, from someone who's actually made this huge shift um, for their business. How did you determine the best tools of communication? And how did you navigate if you needed to use um, multiple platforms for the different types of connections that you need to make? Yes, great question. So my first performance gig actually got canceled on March 12th. And prior to that, um, I actually had a friend who uh, lives in China and she had been quarantined at that point for almost 60 days already. So living in a city in New York, I already know that we knew that we were kind of next up in line. Um, so honestly, at first I was a little numb. So many of my performance gigs that I was excited for were slipping right through my fingers. Um, it was also right in the middle of audition season, which is a super important part of the year for us dancers as well. Um, so I made it through about half of my scheduled auditions before they were um, canceled. So all that to say there was a lot going on or not a lot going on uh, really fast. Um, so the first thing I did was listen. What does my community need and what can I do about it? One thing that I heard um, another dancer and entrepreneur Chanel De Silva say recently in an interview that I thought was really interesting and important is that when you're developing new and creative ideas and content, make sure you ask yourself, is it new, better, or different? Otherwise, you're just adding to the noise rather than singing your own unique part. So like I said, the first thing I did was listen. My community needed to dance and move. And you have to understand, as professional dancers, we can work from 10 a.m. all the way till after midnight. Um, so we're used to being very active and using our bodies all day long. So when we say we needed to move, we really needed to move. So back to, like, back to what I said, new, better, different. So let's use teaching for an example. Teaching class online wasn't anything new or different. If you log on to Instagram Live right now, you'll see plenty, probably thousands of dance and fitness classes. You can virtually take from anybody right now. You can take pretty much anything right now. So how can I offer something better? Um, I went back to listening. And I'm on the steering committee of the Dance Artist National Collective. So I was hearing so many horror stories from dancers losing work and not having reliable income. Um, but as I would scroll down my Instagram and Facebook feed, I would see so many overpriced and awkwardly suggestive donation -y classes. Um, unfortunately, dancers are some of the most overworked but underpaid and undersupported workers in the in entertainment industry. So when COVID hit us, we really got hit. Charging my community at that time didn't seem right. They couldn't necessarily afford these types of classes. Um, Capizio was a longtime partner of mine. I've modeled for them in the past as well as worked on several different campaigns. Um, so we started communicating um, about their, them offering free classes on their Instagram lives. And they asked me if I'd be willing to come in and teach. And this was a great opportunity. Uh, this was excellent because it allowed me to still support myself and be compensated fully and fairly for the work that I was doing while not depleting my community of the resources that they really didn't have at that time. Um, so with Capizio and things like the Met, we've mostly been doing Instagram Live as that's the easiest platform because anybody can log on. If they miss it, it's up for 24 hours. 
Um, and it's also easier to share login credentials if you're kind of changing teachers every day and stuff like that. It's also great because you don't have to worry about things like hacking or Zoom phishing. Um, we've, also, we've also toyed around with the idea of Patreon so that people can leave direct donations. Um, but as donations haven't been our first priority, we're still working to explore that more fully. Um, like the rest of the world and us right now, I've been on Zoom like 24 seven. Uh, Zoom is great because um, it's great for classes where you want to interact with the people that you'll be online with. So if you're teaching a block at a studio like Joffrey or at a high school or a university, for instance, um, it's really important that the students can see you, but also that you can see the students and hear them as well. Um, so I've had meetings of all sizes and types on Zoom. Um, obviously, you can host super cool webinars on here. Um, you can also do private lessons, small to large meetings, small to large classes. Um, one of the only downsides is that you uh, can't have as many people on live stream or on these types of um, services. So for my first Capizio Live, I had about 6,000 unique live viewers. Uh, which was really exciting. Um, but something like that would be really hard to faci facilitate on a platform like Zoom. Um, so a great alternative to Zoom um, for those types of situations is more of a, a live streaming platform. Um, if you have a smaller group, you can consider things like Google Hangouts. Um, and depending on your relationship with your client or your team, you can also use the free features on your iPhone, such as FaceTime or the group FaceTimes as well, obviously depending on your relationship with the client. Um, but, but a quick rule of thumb, if the back and forth interactions are super important, I would recommend something like Zoom, but for larger scale workshops, um, consider a live streaming service like YouTube or Instagram Live. That's great, thank you. And that's amazing to hear that you had 6,000 on your first class, congratulations. So let's keep exploring and going down this road. Ellen, can you elaborate on the different types of offerings? I know that we've, we've done some research here at Vistaprint on the different types of platforms because there are so many different types of businesses using them. Have we seen any trends about which types of businesses are using which platforms? Mm -hmm. Yes, absolutely. So in terms of, I mean, you know, and actually all the folks on the call probably know that there are you know, more kinds of businesses out there than one can even think of. And so the way I like to think of the video platforms that fit different kinds of businesses is less along the lines of a particular industry and more along the lines of what kind of service you're looking to offer. So specifically for like one-on-one -on -one consultations or small group meetings, uh, I know a lot of folks use Zoom. Um, we're on Zoom right now. You also hear some things in the news about like security and this, that, and the other thing. So in our research here at Vistaprint, what we found is that WebEx is also a really great option for small businesses. WebEx recently, uh, expanded the duration in terms of how long you can run a meeting on the free basic subscription and it's now up to 24 hours whereas with Zoom if you're not able to afford the monthly fee I think you're capped at like 40 or 45 minutes so WebEx the free package is great for small businesses if everyone's on an Apple device FaceTime like Antoine mentioned is also great um, for small group meetings whether it be WebEx or Zoom or Google Hangouts those are great um, if everyone has like a Gmail address. Um, my sister, <laughs> uh, we live here in the DC metro area and she works for a puzzles and board game store. So their retail location is obviously closed, like closed, closed, closed. Um, but something that they're doing now that they never really did before was they're offering Dungeons and Dragons games, sorry, Dungeons and Dragons campaigns um, online so people can register with them, you know, set up basically a small group meeting, call in at that time, and then have a three hour experience kind of run by my sister in the store. So that, that's an example of like a new virtual service. Um, it's a small group meeting. Uh, for live stream classes, I think it can be tricky and, you know, in our research, we find that like the, the tempo and the beat for a fast paced music class or a fast paced dance class, that can be really difficult on one of these video platforms in which there is that interactivity. So for something like an exercise class, a music class or a dance class, that is fast paced in that way, we definitely recommend live streaming just like Antoine also found. So that could be Facebook Live, Instagram Live, or you can live stream on YouTube as well. And then the other type of video or virtual service that we're seeing for small businesses is producing like high quality on demand content. So of course, 
uh, small businesses are able to post videos on YouTube that their audience can go and look at, you know, anytime on demand. Another great option for small businesses that's a little bit less well known is Patreon. So with Patreon, you ask your audience to become subscribers or patrons. They pay a certain fee either per month or every time you post something new. So if you have really high quality, super premium content, you know you have a devoted following, Patreon could be a great way to monetize that. For example, there's this restaurant in Connecticut um, called Daddy Jack's and they had a super popular YouTube channel. It was called Daddy Jack's Cooking the Blues. And so they would you know, bring a video camera into the restaurant kitchen and show the chef, Daddy Jack, you know, making recipes, um, you know, of meatballs and chicken marsala and that kind of thing. And so when the restaurant closed due to COVID-19, something they did is they switched over to Patreon and started posting recipe videos there. So the devoted followers could become subscribers. They could keep some income rolling in the door and keep producing that content that they know people love. So bake Z or whatever it may be. So Wherever possible, you know, I would always recommend exploring like the zero dollar like free options and see which of those video platforms might work for your business and the kind of services that you offer. So I love those examples. Thank you. Um, I think both of you have just provided a really great breakdown of all the different types of platforms out there. There's so many. So I think this is so helpful to, to learn about which different types are good for what you're actually trying to achieve. Um, so let's say you've got your new, better, different idea, and you think that you've chosen the right platform for you. So now you're at the point where you are preparing to actually um, present your service or your class online. And it's obviously different from in-person classes and services, but can you lay it out for us, Antoine? What can you tell us about how you prepare for these online classes? Yes, uh, great question. So this is actually really important. Um, so how you prepare for online classes is a little different than how you prepare for an in-person class. And it's actually more like how I prepare for a performance. So let's think of it this way. Before I have any performance, I always have a tech rehearsal and a dress rehearsal. So before you teach any class, make sure that you have a tech and a dress. Okay, so let's talk about tech. With music, Let's think about our volume levels, right? So can you hear the music, but can your viewers still hear the music and can they hear you? So that's something you wanna think about before. Um, is your music selection organized in an order? Um, during class is not the time to be setting up your playlist, right? You wanna have all of that set up before. Um, is your music age appropriate? So the music that I would choose for a Capizio class is gonna be different than a class I might host on my own or teach for my colleagues at the Met. Um, and one thing I've been seeing a lot is that a lot of people didn't remember that they could or that they couldn't uh, be on Instagram live and play music at the at the same time. So a lot of people's first class, the first 15 minutes of class is them trying to figure out how to get the music and everything together. So that's something that should definitely be figured out before the class happens. Um, next thing that I have to think about in a tech rehearsal is the stage and the set design. So same thing here. Where are you going to be teaching? Do you have space? Is this the best angle that you're gonna be shooting for people to see what you're doing? Um, is lighting good? You can't tell right now, but it's a rainy day in New York, so I had to set up a softbox just to make sure that we had good lighting. So can everyone see what you're doing? Um, do you need mirrors? Um, sometimes, as you can see, I have a mirror, I guess it's over there. Um, and it's not showing it at this angle, but if I was teaching a class, I could set up a mirror behind me so that people could see me from the back. Uh, when we're in a dance class, it's a, in a rehearsal or anything like that, it's a 360 experience. So I'm taking in information from the person in front of me, from the mirror that's in front of them, as well as how they move and interact through space. So you want to keep all of that in mind as you kind of set up your set design. How can you uh, set up as many tools in the space for people to get as much value from the class as possible? And then lastly, for tech, you want to know your cast. Who's in it, okay? <laughs> if it's just you, it has to just be you. So make sure you let everyone in your apartment, your roommates, your partner, everyone know that you're teaching a class or offering a service so that your space can remain quiet and professional. After you have your tech, then we go into our dress rehearsal. So what are you wearing? Does that look good on camera? Can your audience see what you're doing? Uh, what are you gonna say? Um, when teaching on live, people still expect notes and feedback. So think of potential questions you would have in a class or a session similar to the one that you're presenting. And those are probably um, great questions to kind of think of ahead of time. And 
the hardest thing that I find in teaching live classes is trying to answer questions, but like live questions, but then also sit the class in like an hour and an hour and a half block. So uh, going through any potential questions that you might get during the class will allow you to answer them before time or before, the, before you really get into stuff to save you some time later on. Um, as well as make sure that people are getting notes and feedback from the class as well. Um, and if you need help um, finding out some things to give feedback on, make sure that you take your class before you give your class so you can see what things you struggled with, um, what, what moments did you find imbalance or uh, were you fatigued? And those are probably the same places that your audience will feel the same things in. Um, and then after all of that, you're ready for your performance. Um, like I said, this could be an incredible opportunity for new people, new potential clients, and new eyes on your business. Um, I was very fortunate to have about 6,000, uh, like I said, unique live viewers on Capizio. Um, and yes, I did bring a lot of my people in, but a majority of those people were just seeing me for the first time. So those first impressions and lasting impressions, and these could be uh, potential clients for not only now, but uh, post COVID as well. Thank you so much. Um, I can definitely say that all of this about preparation really rings true for me personally. These live sessions aren't something that we had done at Vistaprint before. So this was all very much a learning process for us as well. And we learned a lot of those tech points that you made too. Um, and also about lighting. We learned a lot about lighting as well. So thank you yeah. so much. <laughs> So Ellen, once you feel like you have all this planned and you are prepared, you're ready to go, how do you recommend getting the word out and actually getting registrations? Mm -hmm. Yeah, great question. So Antoine provided the perfect example. I'm guessing that in your gigantic 6,000 person dance classes, you mentioned that you brought some of your loyal folks with you and some folks are brand new to you. I bet you almost anything that you posted on social media so that your followers could join you in that class, um, maybe send a couple emails or even post it on your website. Is that, does that sound right? No, nope, it's absolutely right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, that's such a perfect example for any small business when you know that you have something awesome coming up, like a class or you're offering appointments for one on one consultations. Um, something that you can do is, you know, pick that date a little bit in advance. Um, and then blast it out to the people who already know and love your business and your brand. So that's definitely posting on social media, whether that be Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, wherever else. Um, sending out messages to your email list and even posting about it on your Vistaprint website. If you know you're gonna have a couple of these kinds of events, classes, appointments, whatever, I definitely recommend putting up uh, a calendar or even like a list of upcoming events on your website if you wanna keep it simple. Um, and then of course, wherever you're communicating with your audience and your potential customers about these events, definitely offer like all the paths. So it's super easy for them to register, for them to pay you if you're doing payment um, and for them to be able to call in at the time. So I definitely recommend including the video conference call in details and links to places to register when you communicate out in advance about that class coming up. Awesome, thank yeah. you. And Antoine, I know we talked about sending out reminders. Um, yeah. you know with that? Yeah, thanks, Corey. So one thing that I found to be really helpful is uh, sending out reminders. So maybe about a week out, you can let people know that you're gonna teach the class. Um, and then usually about two to three days out, I send a quick reminder. So that first week out is like the longer uh, email where I give the full write up of what the class is gonna be. And then maybe for that two to three day uh, before moment, it's a little bit shorter of an email, just kind of saying, hey, don't know if you saw my last email, just a friendly reminder that I have class in a couple of days or I'm holding this really cool session in a couple of days. And then on the day of, I found it really helpful to just send out a quick paragraph with the link to the Zoom or the um, Instagram live just to remind people about what's happening. And what we have to remember, I think we assume that like, because we're in quarantine that everybody is like sitting around scheduling Zoom appointments. And that is, I guess, true in a way, um, but we are still busy. And I, I feel like I've been as busy and sometimes busier than I was before with all these uh, teaching classes and lives. So we have to remember that people have schedules that they're navigating. So it's really important to try to send out as many reminders as possible before your class or your session. 
Yes, I definitely agree. I personally need the reminders for sure. And I do appreciate them. I don't find them intrusive. So I, I absolutely recommend that as well. So I want to shift gears here just a little bit. We've been talking about classes and services as a, a one-to-many type of experience. So group classes, group services, but there's a whole set of businesses that might need something a little bit different. And that would be one-to-one -one appointments or just booking an appointment um, in general. So we know that not everybody on this session has a Vistaprint website, but we do know that a number of you are customers. So Ellen, I would love if you can take a minute here to actually uh, live show us how someone can set up online booking if they've got a Vistaprint site and any tips that you might have for setting up that online booking if you don't have a Vistaprint site or just generally what businesses should be thinking about when they're setting up this online booking. Sure. So the great thing about setting up an online appointment book is that your customers or your clients can schedule you for a time that works for them. So I mentioned my little sister earlier, um, her business, bless their hearts. I think they do a lot of emailing back and forth with customers to like figure out the right day and time that works for them to have their Dungeons and Dragons appointment. Um, and so some of the things I recommended to her, I mean, what do I know? I'm just the older sister. But um, one of the things I recommended to her was an online appointment book. Um, and I would suggest this, you know, to any business that is offering those virtual services, and even for in-person services. I mean, one day things are going to go back a little more towards what was normal. And so offering an online appointment book makes it super easy for your customers to schedule you either for virtual or in-person appointments at a time that works for them. So I'm gonna share my screen real fast. Here goes, wish me luck. Um, <laughs> so this is the Vistaprint website builder and hopefully it's gonna be familiar to some of y'all. So this is a template we created for businesses that might be offering virtual classes or appointments. And so just as a quick example, something that you can do is if you have an online appointment book or you have a calendar somewhere, you can hyperlink a button to this. So please add a link and you can link it to something external. Um, so, for example, one of the appointment booking services that I really like is something called setmore.com. We're not affiliated with them. They just happen to have a free service that has a lot of really robust features that works really well for small businesses. So set more is an option. You may also have heard of like youcanbookme.com or even public Google calendars. So this is setmore.com. I set up um, a calendar right here. These are my open hours for my, you know, fake small business. Um, and then these are some class times that people can book. Um, so you can see I'm available from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. and have some times blocked off. So what's cool about this is that you have a booking page. And so a customer can come here and say, oh, I want to purchase an appointment along the lines of one of these services. You can have different time lengths and different prices, or they can say, I want to purchase a seat in an upcoming class. And so something that you can do is you can hyperlink this appointment booking page. You can copy and put that back here save changes and now your button is going to be hyperlinked to that page so when a customer is on your website they click this join our virtual classes button they're going to be redirected to my booking page so this is really useful and also means that you've just taken a customer off of your website where you really control the whole brand experience and where they can learn more about you another thing that's really cool a little bit more advanced is here in setmore.com if you scroll down, there's something called the website booking widget. So if I click this, it's, it's gonna end up looking like that. You can place the button somewhere on my website or float it on the side. I'm gonna do placing it. Um, you can do an overlay on top of the website so people are never leaving your website when they go through the booking process. And then I say, I'm going to embed the code myself. All right, so this is the code. Scary, right? No, all we're doing is copy pasting, I promise. So we're gonna select all of it and copy. And then we're gonna go back here to the website builder. So let's say that I wanted to, I'm gonna eventually replace this button. I'm gonna add an element right here. And that element is going to be the HTML embed element. 
So we have this reminder here that you should always trust the source of HTML embed code that you're pulling from somewhere else and putting onto your website. Um, just because HTML is powerful. So always get code only from a trusted source. If you don't trust the source, don't put it on your website. So I understand. And here we are. Settings. Now this is where I'm going to paste in the code that I had just copied a moment ago out of setmore.com. I update. And now here's this book appointment button. So what's cool about this is I'm publishing my website. So all the latest changes go to the web. Here is my website and this is the widget right there. So if you click this, all of a sudden you have the appointment booking overlay right here. A customer can go through and they can select, I want basketball consulting and I want it today at 3.30 p.m. And they can go through the whole login process. If you have payment set up, you can request them to pay the appointment fee at this time during the reservation process. Makes it super easy. And then when they're all done, they're still on your site and they can learn about everything else. So any website builder um, may or may not have an HTML embed element, but I bet you every single one has some kind of button element that you can hyperlink to something like a public booking page. So I would definitely recommend doing this on your homepage. Maybe you have another page that describes your services and you also link to your online appointment book there. Um, no matter what, I definitely recommend that you offer multiple paths. So it's super easy wherever your customers are coming from, that they can get to your online appointment book and reserve with you. Um, I should mention that you can even include the hyperlink to your online appointment booking page, the public page. You, that could be the link in your Instagram bio. You know, it's easy to share this on social media as well, even if you don't have a website. This is awesome. Thank you for walking us through that. Uh, that's really helpful. Thank you. So I think we get to a point now here uh, where we need to make a decision if you're a business about charging for your services. And we've talked a lot of our webinars in the past regarding communication about selling right now and that it requires a lot of sensitivity, like you said earlier, Antoine, but you're still a business and people still want your services. And honestly, a lot of them now more than ever that we're stuck inside. So I know that both of you can weigh in on this, but Antoine, let's start with you. Your, your feet on the ground here. You're doing this right now yourself. Can you get us rolling talking about ways that you can continue to support yourself as a business while not depleting your community of money that's needed for resources during the global pandemic. Um, talk us through how you've handled it. Yeah, that's a tricky one. Um, Cause we're all, we're all missing something um, and we're all missing something, including money. So it's this hard thing because there's definitely a rise in demand for services such as like dance or fitness classes, but people don't necessarily have the funds to afford those right now. Um, so I kind of, I didn't come up with this, but I've been thinking about it this way. Um, the four W's, um, who, what, when, and why. Like I said, I didn't make it up, but <laughs> you wanna think about those four things when deciding about charging for classes. So first off is who? You have to know your audience, okay? So at, at the beginning, my priority wasn't to charge individuals a lot for any of my services because I knew my audience and I knew that they didn't have it, right? So my audience is professional dancers. And like I mentioned earlier, professional dancers are some of the most underpaid, um, overworked, like we can go down the list, right? So I mentioned that earlier. So where these dancers were, were gonna get money for my $22 classes, um, I didn't know, right? So the first thing is who? You have to know your audience. Larger organizations, however, did have more of that funding. Um, dance schools, high schools, colleges and universities already have people who have paid tuition. So I know they have the budget, right? The students who have already paid that said tu tuition do not have that budget, right? So after you think about who, you want to think about what. What are you offering? And you have to be super clear about that. So you want to go back to that thing we mentioned earlier. Is it new, better, or different? And then if it's not, um, you're charging people, like I said, for a lot of noise, right? Um, next up is when. So when does the value hit? If it's money, uh, like liquid cash, uh, it'll hit immediately. But there's other types of value that you can get during this uh, moment. Um, I'm one of the last advocates for pay via exposure, but uh, in this moment, there are several new ways to get uh, future value out of new clients. So one thing I've been trying is 
telling people um, after my class to invite someone, when, someone with them to the next session or class. Um, so I told them to think of something that they took away from the class and go share it with someone. And this has been great because it allows my audience to clearly identify the value that they get from my um, class or my session, um, but it also allows them to share that value with someone else, which could entice them to come to the class themselves. Um, but you have to remember, a lot of people don't have it today, uh, but they will remember the value that you gave them when this is all over. Um, and then lastly, you want to think about why. So the price of your class should match the value of what you're offering. So as a professional dancer and teacher, I doubt that what I'm offering people um, on Instagram Live or via Zoom is going to match up anywhere near to what I offer people in a real life in-person class, right? So if my class is $22 at a New York studio, which in my opinion is a little bit overpriced, um, how then can I charge someone $22 for the same class online? So in my opinion, you either need to add more value or lower the price. Um, so how can you add value? Um, I'll use my example because my story is the only one I can tell, but um, you can include things that maybe don't um, usually get communicated in person that become, become kind of this like online bonus content. So for any of, say, my Horton-based modern classes, Horton is a modern dance style that we do sometimes as dancers for my non-dancers in the audience. Um, whenever I'm teaching that or a technique or style that I know people are less familiar with, I always start my class with the pre-session history lesson. Or if it's a repeating class, I'll do a refresher on what we uh, learned last week. And this is great because it gets return clients engaged, but it also makes newcomers feel welcome. Um, I also try to include additional helpful links and websites that I might not be able to offer in an uh, in-person class. You can also offer uh, book recommendations, and I've also been toying with uh, sharing like my Apple Music playlist or my Spotify playlist from the class. Um, and this is great because this makes people feel like once the class is over, they still have something that they can take away with them. So um, I'm not... Uh, trying to imply that you should not be paid for your services right now, but I think it would be wise to just make sure that the people that you are charging can actually um, afford to pay for your services right now. And one thing that I heard in a um, meeting I was in last week that I think might be helpful for the people listening is that the amount of money on the planet didn't just like all of a sudden disappear, right? Uh, our money did not catch the coronavirus, right? So the amount of money is still here, but we just have to identify where that money is. The rich people are still rich, the poor people are still poor. So if they didn't have the money to afford those classes before, they're probably not gonna be able to afford them now. So I think that there has to be an enhanced level of sensitivity right now um, for your clients. And maybe you just have to get creative about um, the compensation that you're gonna re uh, receive uh, during this pandemic. Thank you, Antoine. I, it's obvious that you were really thoughtful in your execution here. I'm sure that your audience has appreciated that. And I love your tips about adding value and looking at this as a way to really grow the audience that you already had. Um, this definitely gives a lot of entrepreneurs and businesses a platform to get in front of people that they might not have ever reached before. So I think that's a really positive way of looking at it. So Ellen, um, you mentioned Patreon earlier. Can you talk us through um, some other tools that people can use to handle processing payment? Sure. So Antoine, I, I mean, I agree the level of thought and sensitivity that you've put into who to charge and when and how and how much. That's exactly the kind of thing that I know small businesses are really trying to zero in on a sweet spot for, for their customer bases. And I think another thing to think about is, you know, when over the course of your service, you are going to either charge folks or ask for a contribution, or if you're a nonprofit, might be asking for a donation. And I really think of that in three chief ways. So one would be a paywall. You know, you got to pay up front in order to get over that wall to access the content. Um, two would be free to join and requesting tips. And then the third would be pay any time after the fact, doesn't really matter. So for paywalls, Patreon is a great example of a paywall. You need to become a paying subscriber or patron in order to access that really premium content. Um, 
Another option is that if you use an appointment booking tool with payment transactions built in, you can require the customer to pay their fee or pay a deposit at the time that they make the reservation. So setmore.com has this with Square and with Stripe. Um, I know Square has their own appointment booking tool. Um, or even if you're, you know, like my sister doing our emailing back and forth with your clients, you can say, you know, hey, I need you to, um, you know, put down the deposit or put down the fee via PayPal or whatever it may be. And that's what will confirm the time slot we've been talking about. So those are different ways that you can really secure that payment up front if it makes sense for your business and for your service. The second item would be free to join tips requested. So this is a really great fit for live stream classes. And something I would definitely recommend is to mention, you know, at the beginning, in the middle, and at the end of class where you want folks to make that contribution or tip or donation. Um, something I've seen is also like showing that on the screen. Um, so, for example, you know, you can have a sign or have a pop up um, saying, you know, this is the URL where you go, you know, this is my PayPal.me page, or this is the nonprofit that I'd love for you to contribute to today. Um, and then, of course, providing that link as well in the description beneath the video. So whether that's in Facebook or on YouTube. Um, so I would definitely encourage you to offer, once again, multiple paths for to your audience to find that place to pay online. Um, and then finally, if you work with longtime clients, you are working on, you know, a long-term relationship or, you know, you, you really have a, an ongoing project that you're working on with them, um, your payment transactions with them might be a little bit more like an invoice after the fact. Um, and so something I would encourage you to do is definitely um, to you know, with that trusted client with whom you have that great relationship um, to include the payment details um, in emails, calendar invites, social media on your website, just so it's really easy for that customer to find it whenever it occurs to them. Um, of course, thank them after the service and remind them in writing via email of the um, agreed upon amount and if there's any kind of time frame, that's what I'd recommend. Um, but yeah, I think all of those are great ways that small businesses can make it really easy and really frictionless for a customer to pay them for that valuable service at any time. Well, thank you both. I know it's definitely a tricky balance right now when we're talking about charging and taking payments. So I appreciate the consideration in those answers. And Ellen, you, you've mentioned thank yous and following up. So let's move on to the end of that online offering process and that's following up after you've had a successful class or a webinar or appointment. So what are some best practices that you would recommend to stay connected with your customers afterwards? Yeah, absolutely. So of course, thanking folks for their time and for their loyalty. I love how Antoine talked about, you know, bring someone with you next time or tell someone what value you got out of this class. Like that's genius. Um, asking for feedback. You know, we're all continuously evolving, particularly as we adapt to the new kind of remote way of the world. So definitely asking for feedback and asking what you can improve on. Um, of course, a great moment to ask for, you know, tips or the fee or donations for a nonprofit that you care about. Um, if you have permission from your customers to take a photo or a screenshot during the class or during the appointment, that is a great way to be able to show a future customer, this is exactly what a service with me looks like. This is what the experience could be like for you. So if you have that permission, um, taking that image and sharing it later, that's a great thing to do. Um, if you are a business that is really popular on Yelp or you're strongly rated on Google or you're trying to become one of those businesses, right after class is a great time to ask for a review. Um, you can tell your customers about future classes and link them to your schedule and encourage them to book again. Um, I definitely encourage you to write yourself notes on what you want to change next time. Um, Antoine, earlier you mentioned realizing that you couldn't play music and stream a class on one device, you had to have two devices. I bet almost anything that was a note you wrote for yourself, right? Yeah, cool. Um, Absolutely. So yeah. <laughs> yeah, and then um, another thing I'll mention is that um, 
I strongly, strongly, strongly recommend that small businesses use meeting passwords that you either have unique to each appointment or that you change as frequently as possible, for example, on a daily basis. So um, earlier I mentioned WebEx. They generate unique meeting passwords for every single meeting. On Zoom, you have a standing password and maybe you wanna change that daily or every couple days. Um, if you're changing that password, make sure to send the new accurate password out to your next customers. Um, and then finally, you know, keep innovating, stay connected with your customers, keep driving business. Awesome, thank you. Antoine, anything you would add there from your experiences? Well, Ellen killed it, but um, I guess I would say I kind of start with uh, pre-class stuff. So I try to send out a lot of stuff before class. So like the reminders we said earlier, I try to make sure that I have at least three different reminders going out to remind people about the class or the session. Um, I've also found it to be helpful to send out a few um, materials before. So I'll send uh, people what they need for the class or the session, whether that be a water bottle, a foam roller, or a towel. Uh, for some of these viewers, it could be their first time um, in your space, taking your type of class or getting your type of service. So you want to make them feel comfortable and as prepared as possible. Um, as we all probably know, emails are the most valuable type of user information. Um, Facebook has come and gone and come again, and MySpace used to be popping, and Instagram is hot right now, and so is TikTok. Uh, but one thing that we've all had this whole time has been an email address. Um, so like we've been saying earlier, um, try to make sure you follow up either at the end of your uh, session to try to get as many emails as possible, or make sure that you have something on your website uh, to collect emails. Um, but that's definitely a powerful way to continue to communicate with your new audience members. Um, and as a teacher or host, if you don't see someone who was in your class who was there for before, maybe send up a follow up and see why they weren't there. Maybe they forgot, which means maybe you need more reminders. Uh, maybe they didn't like the class, which is can be helpful information on things you can work on, or maybe your class just isn't for them. Um, maybe they were busy, which might seem hard to be right now, but it's definitely possible. Um, and maybe your class was too expensive. Um, whatever it is, all of that is great information uh, to know. So it's good to remember that if someone stops showing up in real life, you, you know, follow up and check in and see what happens. So you want to kind of keep those same things in place with your new online audience as well. Great. Thank you both so much. I think this has all been really helpful information. So thank you. I'd like to turn it over to questions now. And I see we definitely have a few already in the Q&A here. I'll definitely keep, keep those coming. Um, I'm going to get us started off here. Ellen, I would love if you could take this one. I don't know if this came up in our Vistaprint research. Security is a main concern of mine due to the type of business I run, hypnotherapy. And I need to make sure the meeting is secure for HIPAA compliance. I've heard Zoom is the only one that's HIPAA compliant. Do you know if WebEx or the other services that you mentioned are HIPAA compliant? Ooh, that's a great question. I do not know, but I guarantee you that any service that is HIPAA compliant will make that very, very clear. Um, so I do encourage you to go to WebEx.com. You can do a quick search for HIPAA or look at their documentation or their FAQs. Um, and I know almost any of these services will have some kind of useful customer service, whether it be by phone or via chatbot. Um, so I would, I would look to get that information definitively from the horse's mouth. Perfect, thank you. Uh, Antoine, I think you probably have a lot of experience with this next question, so I'm going to toss it over to you. How do I market myself to sell my products? And this person has put in their Instagram, so I would love any tips that you have about um, promoting your product, promoting your service and yourself on your Instagram account. Yes. Um, so let's see, where do we start? <laughs> um, I'd say I just, I'll give some tips that I found to be, be the most helpful. Um, consistency. Uh, so it was in 2017. If anyone watching knows, knows me, they know this story. But I told myself I was going to post on Instagram every other day for every day during 2017. And if you go to my Instagram, there's evidence. I posted every other day in 2017. And that's when my Instagram account grew, grew so much. I think that's when I um, got past my 10,000 
uh, follower mark at that time. So consistency is really important. Um, quality is really important. So before we even get to sending stuff out, you want to make sure that the stuff that you're sending out for people to see really represents your business in the best way possible. Just like if you were meeting a new client in real life, you wear your, your best outfit, maybe your nice accessories, you make sure everything looks good and polished and ready to go. You want to keep all of that in mind as you're meeting um, new online clients as well. Um, and you can obviously consider uh, uh, buying ads through Facebook or Instagram or Google. Um, but you can also just utilize hashtags, which are kind of like free ads. Um, and you can do more research. There's several people who can probably explain it better than me. Um, but consider just using the tools that you already have, such as hashtags or tagging interested brands or um, if you're like, for instance, a dance creator um, and you're looking for new dance clients, maybe you can look up hashtag dance and see what other people are also interested in dance, for instance. And maybe, hey, if I see a dancer who posts a really cool post that I like, I can maybe like it and say, oh, I think that's really neat. And then maybe they'll do the same on my page. And then that's a new connection that I've made. And maybe it's just a friend, but it could also turn into a potential client. Um, so it's really the weird thing about online media and communication is that uh, the people who are communicating are still the same. So the same things that are important to us, that same type of warmth and connection and consistency are the same things that are important online as well. That's great. Thank you. Okay, so we've got a few more questions um, coming in here. Corey, real oh, fast, I mentioned you know, I did a quick yeah. search and it looks like WebEx is HIPAA compliant if you make sure that you configure your settings the right way. Awesome. Thank you so much. Ellen, actually, it would be great if you can take this next question here. Uh, is there a way that I can show my live stream on my website? Yes. Yes, there is. It's pretty cool, actually. Okay. Um, uh, can I share my screen and show you all the website builder again? Is that all right? Yes. Yeah. Let's do that. So this is how it works on the Vistaprint website builder, um, but any other website builder probably is going to have some similarities. So one of the things that we make it really easy to do is to pull your Facebook page onto your website. So for example, let's say um, right above latest classes, I wanted to pull my Facebook page in. So right now this is going to load just showing the Vistaprint Facebook page, but oh my God, we're hosting a live webinar on Facebook right now. Um, what you can do is by pulling your Facebook page activity onto your website, if you're live streaming via Facebook Live, a customer on your website can see that and can start watching your live video right in your website. Um, so I won't play that right now because I think that would send us down a <laughs> loop of madness. But, um, but yeah, if you were to publish the site, and then go look at it. This would be what your customer or your website visitor would see. You scroll down um, and then Facebook's going to show up right here and then they can start streaming that live video right there on the website. Very cool. Thank you. That's awesome. All right. So just a quick time check here. We have a few more minutes left. I'm going to take one or two more questions and then we are going to close it out for the day. Uh, but we'll send you some resources in the follow up email. We'll send the recording. Um, we'll also send a link to an article that we have about running online classes. And I also see a question here in the Q&A about sending out the information for those virtual services assistants like Set More and You Can Book Me. So we can definitely include that in the email as well. So let's see here. Uh, this is actually a question that's come up a lot. Um, so Antoine, I would love if you could answer this from your perspective. I've been creating a series of tutorials, which are now almost ready, but now I've been reading that my state might be lifting restrictions soon. I'm afraid that if I post my tutorials online, clients will use that instead of coming to see me. Do you think that I should still post them? Um, let's see. So whether you should post them or not, let's take a pause on that one. But let's, I think what's good to think about in this moment is whether the things, the, we, the ways that we're innovating our new businesses, are these gonna be things that only last during COVID or are these tools and new innovations that can help our businesses after COVID? Um, so back to these videos, um, can these videos be supplemental? Um, I know I work with the Actors Fund a lot and we're based in New York and Los Angeles, but now that we're, we have this 
global pandemic, we're reaching people in Chicago. We have people in Idaho, Ohio, Texas, shout out. You know, so we're reaching lots of different people all over the place. Um, so maybe your, your business that you thought was local might be national now. Maybe that's a way that you can kind of reach some new clients. So say if you're doing fitness or dance, um, and I usually have um, in-person clientele, like I just said, maybe you can now expand um, your clients, which could be uh, new business opportunities as well. I think that if you spent time and money and your resources to create these videos, I definitely don't think you should get rid of them. And maybe just get creative and brainstorm new ways that you can send them out and um, different ways that these can be uh, valuable for your business right now. Yeah. Can I jump in with an idea? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, Antoine, I agree with you entirely. I think that something really important for businesses is what marketers call awareness and consideration. So like, have these people even heard of you? Are they aware you exist? And how highly do they consider you relative to other similar options? And so if you have produced some awesome tutorial videos, then, and you're putting that online, that might increase awareness. More people might know that you and your business exist. And if your content is really high quality, if you're coming off as really authoritative, that could help improve your consideration relative to other competitors in your field or similar services. So, um, you know, unless you're providing a tutorial that is a true replacement for whatever service you offer in real life, I bet you almost anything that these are going to help you bring even more folks in the door, virtually or in person, later. Yeah, I absolutely agree. And I would add there, you have a skill that not everybody has, and that's why you created a business, why you're offering services and products. I can tell you I'm definitely looking for a lot of DIY tutorial content right now. But when this is all over, my boyfriend does not want me to continue to cut his hair. He will absolutely <laughs> go back for that. <laughs> um, I cut my hair too, so I definitely know I want my barber back ASAP. <laughs> <laughs> well, the front of it looks great. You did a good job. The front of it does look great. Thank you. <laughs> we'll only talk about the front. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys. So we only have a couple more minutes here. So I, I am going to wrap it up um, for the day because I do want to give you a chance to give us your final thoughts here. Uh, but as I said, check out our article on live streaming from Home Tips. We'll send that out in the follow-up email. Um, you can check it out also on our support small business hub at vistaprint.com. And we are going to be hosting these discussions every Tuesday and Thursday. Uh, the next topic coming up is actually a totally open uh, half hour for questions. Ask us anything um, about taking your business online. So you can join us on Tuesday for that. And feel free to fill out the survey at the end of the webinar. We're looking for all your topic suggestions. So definitely tell us there what else you would like for us to cover there. So before we go, as I mentioned, I would like to ask our panelists for each of their number one final thought from today's conversation. Ellen, can you start us off? Sure. So thank you so much, Corey, for this opportunity. Um, I'm really passionate about our website builder. We've really streamlined it to be useful for small business owners. And I hope that all the information that you know I was able to share, and certainly Antoine's is useful, whether you have our website builder, a different one, or don't have a website at all. Um, my final thought is something that I don't know if we fully touched on which is that you know, any online appointment book, any video-based service, any online payment transaction tool you use, it's really important that all those work really well on mobile devices. You know, people are sitting home you know, with their laptops and desktops and tablets, but let's be honest, most folks are checking out you know, fun, interesting, additional things on their phone. So I really encourage you, um, you know, when you do your research and get some of these online tools set up so you can run a virtual business, have a friend or family member test them from a mobile device and tweak to improve that and make it as streamlined, seamless, frictionless, and mobile friendly as possible. That would be my final thought. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you. Yes, I think mobile is so important. So thank you for pointing that out. Antoine, how about you? I think my takeaway would be kind of our three words for today, uh, new, better, or different. Um, I know some people get stuck uh, trying to create this new business or it's it, maybe it's a business you had before but you have to revamp it for um, an online community and I think if you keep those three things with you you'll always find a way for your business to stand out uh, new better or different 
And I want to say thank you guys so much for having me on today. Um, as a dancer who gets to also say that they're an entrepreneur, um, as well as a digital marketer, it's really exciting to get to come on and share my story and hopefully share with some other artists um, some better business practices and how we can all survive and make it out on the other side. Um, hopefully better than we were before. So thank you guys again for having me today. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for being with us. And Ellen, thank you as well. Um, if you want to learn more, uh, it's on the screen right now. If you'd like to learn more about the Vistaprint website builder, uh, you can check it out, vistaprint.com slash digital dash marketing. And if you would like to learn more about the classes that Antoine is putting on, you can visit his site and his social channels. We have his website, antoinebyers.com, and his handle right there. So definitely check both of those out. Uh, if you have questions, comments, suggestions, other things you'd like to see us cover, you can send us an email to homeofficehours at vistaprint.com. So we are going to wrap up for today. Thank you once again, um, Ellen and Antoine, for joining us. And thank you to the audience for your time and your questions. Um, this has been Home Office Hours Live, and we will talk with you soon.